during winter and summer, we have so many different seasons of celebration, and they just run right into one another um, so quickly. We have Advent and Christmas followed by Ash Wednesday and Palm Sunday and Maundy Thursday and Good Friday and the season of Easter, and then we celebrate Pentecost, and then we have Trinity Sunday, and then nothing, nada, zippo. We count the Sundays off as the fourth Sunday after Pentecost, and the ninth Sunday after Pentecost, and the 16th Sunday after Pentecost. So what are we to do during this time that's called ordinary time? You can always tell it's ordinary time because your pastors, we wear green stoles and the pyramids are green. We stuff almost all the special remembrances and celebrations into half the year, and the rest is just another long and in Florida hot, ordinary season, right? Nope, you got it wrong. <laughs> the answer to that question actually depends on us. Because every single ordinary day can become an extraordinary celebration. I find it interesting that this long season comes shortly after Pentecost Sunday. When we celebrate the Holy Spirit descending upon the apostles and, and the, the birth of the church. And so today, since I didn't get to celebrate Pentecost with you... I'm not going to wear an ordinary stole for an ordinary Sunday. I'm going to put on a red stole to remind me and to remind you that the Holy Spirit doesn't leave during the ordinary season. Okay? <laughs> the flames. This is the color red for flames, for fire, for a reminder. And during our annual conference, the theme was, come Holy Spirit, come. Would you say that with me? Come Holy Spirit, come. And there were times in that conference when our bishop and the cabinet were wandering around the stage with flame headdresses on. It was quite extraordinary. Maybe this ordinary season of Sundays after Pentecost is supposed to provide us time to focus on our relationship with God in a personal way. A time for us not to take vacation from God, but a time for us to step up and re-engage our practices of prayer. Quiet time, study of scripture, and service to others. A time to love God with our whole heart, our whole mind, and I have learned with our, my whole body. When I ride my bike, I have a playlist. Yes, it keeps my legs pumping, but they are praise songs. And I think about and talk to and listen for God when I'm not crossing the street, when I'm riding my bike. Our love of God and worship of God and listening for God can happen all of the time. And I learned a prayer in a course I've been taking. It's called a, a body prayer. It includes four words that begin with the letter A, so I call it the A list. And I'm going to teach that to you today and hope that it helps you find a way to structure your mornings with the reminder of these are things we can do each day to grow our roots deeper. The prayer I learned is based on a prayer prayed by Julian of Norwich in the 14th century, it includes four action verbs, and if we undertake these actions, I am convinced that ordinary season will not be ordinary at all. The first action is a wait. The gesture is to hold our hands out like we do when we receive communion. We're not grabbing, we're not demanding, but we're awaiting. And for people, who live in America today, awaiting is not our strong suit. We are not people who are patient. We're called all the time to wait on God with patience, trust, and endurance. But in our world, it is hard to do that. And it is really hard to do that, friends. When we're going through a time when we're pressed to make a decision or when we're suffering. 
Suffering is hard when we want the suffering to end. And sometimes it feels that we're made to wait too long. So today for our text, uh, I chose a, a text from the book of Lamentations. And I must tell you, I, I've never preached from Lamentations before. If you read the whole book, it is a lament. It is sad. The people are suffering. And in the midst of all of this lamentation, there are these words. Now hear the word of the Lord. The faithful love of of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who depend on him, to those who search for him. So it is good to wait quietly for salvation from the Lord. And it is good for people to submit at an early age to the yoke of his discipline. Let them sit alone in silence beneath the Lord's demands. Let them lie face down in the dust, for there may be hope at last. The word of God for the people of God. God. What's extraordinary about this scripture is we find it in a book that laments the time when Israel was dispersed and conquered and suffering and to just practice their faith was difficult. It was a time of oppression, a time of repentance and a time of sorrow. Now, although most of us are the way Israel suffered during those years, we can also find ourselves in times when God seems not to hear our prayers, when God seems to be absent, when we ask for guidance. We don't like waiting for what we want. We don't like sitting alone in silence. We live in a world of instant gratification. The world around us never slows down. We can text and email and watch TV and be busy 24-7. Please do not text me after 10 o'clock at night. Waiting is foreign to us. I will drive. Does anybody else do this? I will drive five miles out of my way just to avoid sitting through a second cycle of a light. Does anybody else do that? I know some of you do that. You don't have to admit it in public. You know, but in recent years, seriously, since becoming a widow, since surviving breast cancer, I had times where I didn't have any choice but to sit and to wait. No music, no books, no TV. Sometimes there was music. But usually I sat outside in nature. I heard birds. For a while I lived on the beach. I heard the waves and the seagulls. I really learned to hear God's still small voice. I learned that waiting requires humility. We can't be demanding because God's time is not our time. But in the end, I also learn that peace can come even when the answers we long for do not. Once we learn to sit and wait with attitudes of trusting humility, it becomes easier to accept what seems like God's unresponsiveness because we begin to discover that God is responding, just not the way we asked for or hoped for. We learn to accept that God's love and grace will sustain us even through the toughest times and the hardest decisions. And so we transition from awaiting to accepting the second gesture of our prayer. We learn to accept God's love. We learn to accept God's wisdom, which brings new kinds of understanding. And by accepting his love and his wisdom, we learn to accept that we have power within us that is not power that comes from our own strength, but from God's strength. 
One of the most important things we learn to accept is our self. A couple of weeks ago, I listened online when I'm in Pennsylvania, and I heard Dr. Don talk about how God created us good. And then as an aside, he said, if we can accept that. Folks, God created you good, and if you don't accept that, that's one of those things you need to learn to accept. You were made good. The writer of Ephesians describes what happens when we accept what God offers. He writes, Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong, and may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. I love that imagery. Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And that sounds great, but accepting all that requires us to abandon some other things. This is the action for the word abandon. Our heads are bowed. It's an action of submission and humility. Because if we're going to accept all that love and understanding, there's a whole laundry list of things we need to abandon. The Apostle Paul teaches us in 2 Corinthians that Christ died for all. That those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone and the new is here. Now that old creation that lives for Christ means that we have to abandon, our third word, abandon some of our old ways. We don't like to abandon what's comfortable and familiar, even some church-going human ways of judging other people need to be abandoned. Paul specifically said, regard no one from a worldly point of view. But the world teaches us to regard people based on gender, skin color, language, economic status, education level, country of origin, who they love, differences in ability. But Jesus teaches us to love everyone and see every other person as someone created in God's image who is loved by God and who has the capacity to be made new in Christ. We have to abandon doing things in our own power and in our own way. But use the power we accept from God to do God's work through us. And Jesus describes some of the things we should abandon in his Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapters 5 through 7 teaches us about a whole bunch of things we should do and shouldn't do. And Jesus says we should abandon anger toward other people. We should abandon revenge. We should abandon hatred for enemies. We should abandon storing up treasures on earth. We should abandon worry. We should abandon judging others. And once we learn to abandon those things, then we can move from abandoned to attend. Now, for those of you on the camera, I'm going to move over <laughs> for a second because this gesture is like this. This is a gesture, attend doesn't mean come to church and sit in the pew. It's not that kind of attendance. Attend means attend to the task God has empowered us to do as he makes us into a new creation. None of the awaiting, accepting, and abandoning means much if we do not attend to what Christ has taught us to do. I continue on where I was reading in Corinthians. 
It continues to say, all this that we have received, this power, this love, this acceptance, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. Give us the ministry of reconciliation. Is Mike working? Can you, okay, I'm sorry. Who gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Gave us the ministry. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. According to Paul, we are called to be Christ's ambassadors on a mission, a mission of reconciliation. And that's what we need to be attending to. And what kind of ambassadors are we if we lay on our horn when someone's driving too slow while we have our Jesus symbol on the bumper? What kind of ambassador are we when we roll our eyes with impatience at the mom in the grocery store with three kids who's trying to check out and comes up a little short and we roll our eyes and we sigh while we wear the cross necklace around our neck? What kind of ambassador are we when we make someone feel unwelcome at our church because of their appearance or their smell or who they're with? What kind of ambassadors of reconciliation are we when we jump into the online fray with posts that are angry, that support revenge, or that put other people down because their opinion is different than our opinion? We have to be careful about attending to doing God's will. Too often we interpret God's will to be simply sitting in church on Sunday. And it is important to be here or to be worshiping online. But the purpose of that is to empower us to go and to do something. Not to just repeat ritualistic acts or do a religious performance that doesn't include anything else. And Jesus makes this very clear in his ending to the Sermon on the Mount. These are red letters in my Bible, and so I read from my Bible the words of Jesus Christ. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man. Jesus is talking about who just heard the words of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5 through 7. Like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall. Because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice, and does not put them into practice, is like the foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose. And the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Jesus calls us to act, to attend to his teaching, to attend to the practice of his commands. Hear my words and put them into practice. I'm only repeating what he said. Those are Jesus' words. You see, friend, in the end, God does not force us to wait patiently, to receive God's faithful and infinite love, to embrace the redeeming powers of Jesus Christ, or to be guided and empowered by the Holy Spirit. God doesn't force us. God doesn't force us to leave our old ways, to accept God's invitation to be ambassadors for Christ by attending to the work 
we are called to do. God does not force us to live the way Jesus taught us to live. We can choose to await, accept, abandon, and attend. We can choose, but the choice is ours. I find that the practice of this little prayer helps me be intentional about these things. And when practiced in the morning, it also helps me wake up and loosen up because, frankly, those gestures fit beautifully with words to some songs, as you'll see in a few minutes. But for someone who's starting with this prayer, you need to think about what each of these words means. And so um, I don't ask you to bow your heads and fold your hands and close your eyes this morning because that is not a requirement for prayer. And it is not a requirement for this particular prayer. And so let us pray the prayer that I call the A-list. Gracious God, I will await you. I will wait for you to act in your time and not on my time schedule. When it seems like you don't hear me or aren't listening, I will really try to trust you and keep on waiting because you are always faithful. And God, I will accept your blessings. I accept your saving grace and your infinite love. I accept your instruction, even when it leads me on a path different from what I have known, different from what I hoped for. I will abandon myself to you, God. I abandon my dreams that are not your dreams for me. That's hard. I abandon my worldly vices and goals to walk the Jesus way. I abandon the needs of my ego to the call of your spirit within me. And finally, God, I will attend to your plan and your will and do the work you have entrusted to me with these hands and these feet. I will attend to the needs of my family, my neighbors, my church. I will attend to your kingdom here and now in this place, in this community, and on this day. God, I will await your answers and guidance, accept your gifts, abandon my ego, and attend to your way and your work. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now, in the morning, I don't know about you, but when I hit my mid-60s, I wake up in the morning and lots of parts don't want to move. And so I play some songs, sometimes they're hymns, sometimes they're Christian songs, and I do that prayer with my whole body in the living room. Sometimes I dance a little, and no, I am not going to do that here today. And it, it goes something like this. Vicki is going to help me. We're just going to play the chorus of How Great Thou Art. And so you don't have to only hear me sing. I know you know the words to that, and I know you know the words to that. So just help me out a little, just the chorus. Vicki? my soul, my Savior God to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art, then sings my soul. It's funny, it works with almost every song, contemporary or hymns that you love. So in the future, if we're singing a hymn and you see me doing that, I have not lost my mind. I am worshiping God with my whole soul, my whole body, my whole spirit, with all my desire. I invite you to join me if you feel like it. If you're so inclined and you start using this prayer, you might find out that there's not a single solitary, ordinary day in our life with God. Amen? Amen. Amen.